Felix. Um, so we're going to talk about religion and violence. Now, I've been reading some of your articles uh, in preparation. And um, just to begin, there's a just we want to begin with a quote. Okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're in the no spin zone now, Felix. <laughs> <laughs> there are no religious phenomenon, only religious interpretations of phenomenon. Now, you wrote that. Yeah. What kind of seditious heresy is this? <laughs> <laughs> That's atheism, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, this is a good start. You've accused me of atheism and heresy and <laughs> within one minute. Um, that's sedition. That's sedition, okay. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, I, I, think, um, I think the point I'm trying to make is that um, that when we think about religion, we shouldn't think about what has been prescribed as religious. Right. So, uh, and this is something that goes back to you know Kant and the in um, the religion within the bounds of mere reason book that um, you know we shouldn't start from as the assumption that that which has culturally been um, instituted as religion is what religion is. Right. Uh, it's it's related to what religion is about, but it, we shouldn't assume it to be the the, the essence of it. Right. And so, so that's so. What I want to do then is say, okay, what is it in the phenomena uh, that could count as religious? And and that uh, and I don't think there's any region of phenomena that count in that way. Um, but rather, it's the how of the phenomena. And so, what I was trying to do in that article was to say, okay, what is that how? And my suggestion is um, that. It, it's the her, it's that the hermeneutic comes with the phenomena rather than with the subject. So in other words, that the that the self in in the experience of a religious phenomenon is experiencing <coughs> that which um, interprets itself to him or her. That's the that's the uh, that so to speak is how we uh, recognize something as having religious significance. So it's in a hermeneutic tradition, then it's you're you're beginning to examine these things. It's I mean, I don't think you're saying it's just a matter of mere interpretation. On the contrary, you know, I'm saying that it's it's a well, I think it's interpretation is itself rarely mere, I would suggest, right? I mean interpretation is itself a um uh, is never projection. Um but or never solely projection. Um, I think what one finds in religious phenomena is this particular type of passivity uh, where the phenomena, so to speak, insists upon its uh, upon being itself the donor or the giver of its own interpretation. So in that sense, then what, uh, if we're just going to start speaking about religion in a in a broad context, or we can start broad and maybe move more specifically to the topic of violence. What in your research and your studies do you think are the common denominators of religious experience? Because I, I think if you're talking about passivity, it implies a form of experience, yeah. maybe not empirical experience, but a different type of experience, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I think it's first and foremost, um, uh, religious experiences or has always a strong element of affectivity involved. Um, so it's it's not reducible. I mean, I'm not talking in Schleimachian terms that it's reducible in any way to to uh, to feeling, but it is it always has a strong element of affectivity. Um, and and that affectivity is one that uh, in religious experience, um, indicates it to be um, of what I think Heidegger would call ontological significance. So in other words, that uh, you the, the experience is such that the world becomes um, colored by that experience um, and the relationship to the world becomes colored by that experience. That's why somebody like Otto talks about things like awe, right? Uh, and the tremendum and so on. Um, it's that sense of the world um, being transfixed or transfigured uh, by uh, uh, by that which we are experiencing. 
so the atheist then is not privy to those type of moods if you want to say like heidegger would use the term fundamental moods i i have a problem with the very distinction between atheism Go on. and theism honest right i mean i think uh i, I think that distinction it remains on the surface. Um, it can be, you can burrow down, right? I mean, from an atheist perspective or a terrorist perspective, you can get to something fundamental. But to to define the experience just in terms of that difference between theism and atheism is already, I think, to beg the question. Because it is, for one thing, to say that religious experience has to be theistic. And I don't think there's any reason for assuming that. Um, and um, and so no, I would say that the type of experience that comes at the, that that one finds in uh, in, in in religion uh, is one that is uh, is fundamental in the sense that it is uh, is open to all, and I would say is experienced by all uh, at some stage or other. Yeah, so we're we're I guess we're almost in sort of Spinoza territory then, aren't we? That in some sense it's what you're talking about. Well, I I, can't, I don't think you're saying pantheism either. You're you're just talking about a sort of distinct category, perhaps, or maybe that's not the right word, of sort of radical openness to you say ontology. So I presumed in reality itself in some way. Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I don't think uh, one has to at this level decide between, let's say, pantheism, theism, and so on. I mean, like my uh, my phenomenology of Christian life book uh, is trying to, you know, delve into the particular Christian experience, which is one that um, uh, recognizes a transcendence of world, right, um, and. Uh, and trans- recognizes the world as that which, as the you know, the cliche has it, you know, is in the world but not of the world, right? That type of dynamic. Um, uh, one can understand that, you know, it can it can be experienced also pantheistically. Or uh, and 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 what's what's interesting is that um, if you look at profound religious thinkers, uh, they're generally um, not. Uh, strictly orthodox, in the sense that they don't stay within the confines of their own religious traditions. Um, and if you find them um, sensing something pantheistic, or also sensing something acosmic within the experience uh, itself. Um, and that's what I mean about that it's the fundamental thing here, I think, is, is not so much what we label it, or indeed how we then go on and interpret it, although that's important, it comes later, but is rather the experience of not having mastery over the experience itself or over the phenomenon itself, not having mastery in the sense of um, um, uh, understanding the, the, the phenomena as having an excessive meaning, uh, which then needs to be responded to. I understand. I saw, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're saying you're looking for something more fundamental more fundamental than any particular category, classification of religion, be that pantheism, theism, atheism even. And you're trying to get to, I guess, it's kind of a Kantian question, as you said. It's You're trying to find what are the conditions of possibility and even perhaps impossibility of religious life or religious experience. Yeah, no, that's a very good way of putting it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think it's, I mean, the way I, understand doing philosophy is that it's a kind of two tracks, right? I mean, there's a one hand kind of backwards and forwards, so to speak, you know, a back towards that trying to stretch to, 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 to find those fundamental conditions on the one hand, and then forward trying to interpret the most concrete uh, experiences, right? And I think that's what phenomenology does very well. It allows you to do both. And, and indeed to see the, the fundamental conditions inscribed in the very concrete particular experience itself. Okay, then. So when we're talking about sort of those fundamental conditions, I'm trying to think where the term violence comes in then, right? Because that, that thing that we are open to in religious experience, can you then consider that or reflect upon that as a form of violence? Or even perhaps originary violence. I mean, I think I think this works on different levels. Uh, yes, I mean, I think it's violent in that interruptive sense. You know that it it interrupts the um, 
uh, the, the framework of our of our thinking of our of our lives, uh, the framework of our ideologies, uh, even, um, and calls them into question. Um, I think it's violent in that sense, uh, but I think it's also violent in another sense, um, whereby it the very radicality of the experience um, can lead to what uh, Kant calls enthusiasm, um, uh, fanaticism. So the, the, the idea that uh, precisely because of the passivity involved, uh, that one uh, has that sense of having a, um, a, a, a uniquely significant uh, experience that trumps everything else, you know, that trumps the uh, the legitimacy of the society in which one lives. Um, and I think you can see that, I mean, where I kind of, one of the areas I trace this back to is, we say, the wars of religion in Europe, where uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the religious experience, religious insight was legitimate, what gave legitimacy to those who wanted to kill the kill the so-called tyrant, you know, to kill the legit the, the legitimate uh, government of its of its time, um, and you see that you know one doesn't have to look too far to see that today as well. So I mean I think it's it's that kind of there's an interaction there between the the violence of the experience itself and the weight and the violence of the of the potential reaction or response to it. Yeah, I mean when I think of that. That relation the people I sort of reach for is, you know, people like Durkheim and uh, say people like René Girard. And in some way, they are, I suppose, I mean, they speak to what you're talking about, because in some sense, say Girard, for example, he will talk about that two tracks that you're talking about between sort of uh, the foundation of community and uh, the expulsion of the scapegoat, as he says, that's what creates, that's the origin of religious experience. It's the, the, I suppose, the creation or the generation of social unanimity through the expulsion of the scapegoat or the other, if you want to call it that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think, I mean, what Gerard kind of sees is this uh, violent potential within religion. And he, but he sees religion as that which, and I think this is where one has to see this kind of interaction between religion in the sense I'm talking about it and the way it then gets instituted. Um, and I think a lot of the institutions of religion are there ex ex precisely to control this violence to control this disruption. You know, Girard talks about this also in terms of sacrifice, right? I mean, the, that sacrifice is a way of uh, controlling and limiting violence. It's a violence that controls, that limits violence, so to speak. Um, and I think, you know, that is, um, uh, I think you're, you're quite right, Girard and Durkheim, um, uh, clearly see this by right? this, um, and in a very, in a different register, I think you could say Benjamin as well uh, is alive to this um, uh, the, 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 this 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 need to control the violence that's unleashed in an originary way. That's interesting to me, Felix, because it 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 allows us to try and think of religion more, I guess, in a more nuanced way because. I guess what's happening there is that there's, again, that two tracks that you're talking about, there's, well, I suppose the naive criticism of a religion is that it's something essentially violent or is politically violent. And it's, you know, you have the crusades and you have, you know, all these sort of fanatical terroristic events and all of all, all, all of this. But in some way, I think what Gerard is saying is that, yes, yeah, indeed, absolutely, that is there. However, on the other hand, what we're getting is a foundation a foundation of uh, um, there's a quelling of violence of the originary violence. I mean, and I think one of your articles, um, I think it was in your edited collection on violence. You cite you go you go to the, in the, well in the beginning you talk about uh, Cain and Abel, which is kind of a foundational originary violence, but which in turn you get a very 
you get a response to that uh, the idea that you know that we must that religion is about overcoming that in some way and you talk about that in Judaism and Christianity you know sort of sort of two two of the great world religions but uh, it's so uh, and I suppose that's what I'm saying is that the case then, that it's that religion can't escape that originally violence but so much of it is about the foundation of the institution which will help quell that or give us laws and codes which will overcome that ugly brutal or originary truth that originally originally violence kid killing abel and being expulsed from uh, paradise yeah no i i i i think i think that's right but i think it's again one has to be one has to be careful here uh because of course the um the religion in doing that is itself violent you know and um and this is where i find benjamin quite important and significant right because what benjamin shows is that you know you've got this as he calls it this law preserving violence um which um uh, works to um uh, to, to 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 curb and to um uh, to to give boundaries as he says give limitations uh to uh, uh, to those who belong within the community, um, and um, and so the, you, one can't simply see the institutions of religion as benign in this case. I don't think. Right? I mean, they're they're um, uh, uh, and and the other side of this too is that uh, they. I mean, we've talked about the negativity of that violence. Um, but there's a positivity to it too, right? I mean, the Sermon on the Mount is as much, is possibly more, uh, a response to the religious experience I'm talking about, uh, as is the fanatic. Uh, because what the Sermon on the Mount sees is the, um, uh, the auto, uh, it takes the, what I call the mystical response to uh, to this experience, right? So it doesn't see its lack of mastery over the experience as a um, as a license to simply uh, uh, throw off the mantle of uh, of, of normativity, uh, but rather uh, sees it as a um, um, as as to teaching a certain humility and teaching a certain peace, um, and and so and that and it's that very peace which becomes threatening. Uh, if you think about the um, the Grand Inquisitor, you know uh, that Dr. whole yeah, exactly that whole story, right? It's precisely the law preserving violence of the Inquisitor. Uh, that gets challenged by the religious experience of the Christ figure. Uh, but the Christ figure is not um, proclaiming the fanaticism uh, of destruction, uh, but rather is, is uh, proclaiming uh, the, 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 the message of peace, which, and that's the twist, which to the Inquisitor is more threatening than the fanatic, right? Uh, because it 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 undermines his very legitimacy. That's interesting because in and I, I guess that is in continuous. That's continuous with what you've said already. Because in some sense, you're you're overcoming that binary of religion and peace in some way. Because you, that's a very interesting and evocative expression to me, Felix. Because you're saying peace or. The, the peace that religion brings or purports to bring at least is something threatening. Could you maybe say a little bit more about that? Because it's on the surface value, at least it's quite contradictory and that's not necessarily a bad thing, you know, but it's a, it's a productive contradiction, I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, think about, uh, uh, think about the Sermon on the Mount, right? I mean, and think about the excessive claims being made on that, right? Um, and then try to, or try to imagine a society that works that way. Right, that you know, uh, I give my cloak, uh, I give you know everything I have to the beggar, or I turn the other cheek, or I love my enemies. Right, go to um, I don't know, uh, go to uh, the Pentagon with that idea, or go to Downing Street <laughs> with that idea, or go to wherever you know the Elysee Palace with that idea, 
Adele kind of say, well, it sounds really nice. And, you know, that's nice to talk about on Sunday. But, you know, we've got our, we've got our terrorists to fight and we've got our borders to control and so on and so forth. Um, so in other words, the, um, it, the, the institutions of the state uh, require, a leg- require a violence to be legitimated. Right? Uh, they, they, they need that. Because without that, they don't have the force to to impose the law, which is fundamental to uh, to those institutions. And in that way, the, the message of peace is 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 profoundly threatened. So, I mean, I've just been reading Thomas More recently for teaching, and uh, you know, uh, Moore's Utopia. And mm-hmm. again, I guess that's one of the oppositions that you deconstructed there. You laid it out so well. I mean, what is the, what is the what is the sort of essential political narrative? The essential political narrative is this is not possible. We must do grown up politics. Is this practical? Is this concrete? They, you know that Bernie Sanders and that Jeremy Corbyn, they've all got these uh, fanciful ideas, but who's going to pay for it? You know, so all of these things. But in substance, you're saying, and I think this is probably a Heideggerian move that sort of the utopian and the practical are not separable or not necessarily separable you know utopia for realists as uh Rutger bergman called it yeah right yeah well i mean i think you know i mean i think the one thing philosophers need to be clear about is that the world is a messy place you know and and, and sometimes philosophically we don't you know that's not that's not a nice thing to hear because we like nice lines in, in when we're thinking conceptually. Uh, but the world is a messy place, and and there's no the, the distinctions we like to draw um, tend to uh, are much more fluid in reality than that than we would like to think. But secondly, are uh, related in um, the, the oppositions work in, in relation to one another. Uh, and work sometimes to undermine or in some times to reinforce one another. Um, and that's why uh, I really, uh, you know, I, I, I find very interesting or very evocative this, this Christian idea of being in the world and not of the world. Um, uh, because you have both, right? You have the being in the world. Um, and again, to return to the Christian narrative, you know, when Jesus of Nazareth says, you know, give unto Caesar, which is that which is Caesar's, right? When he sees the, the coins, right? So in other words, there is a, a need to live within this, the, the power structures of society. Uh, our every action contributes in some way to that power structure, uh, even to the extent to which we resist it. Um, uh, but uh, that if everything is reducible to that, if our value and our lives are reducible to that, then I think we end up in something resembling a a Gambin's bare life. You know, then, you know, you draw, put that to its logical conclusion. Uh, If you understand the human as purely uh, constituted by by power, uh, then uh, the the human becomes drained of value. and uh, uh, and so it's it's that um, the points of resistance I think within uh, within the world that religion points to, uh, but points to but points to as I say both in in the sense of this notion of peace, but also in a sense of apocalyptical. Um, um, fanatical violence, um, and, uh, and 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 we we can't be uh, unaware of the dangers of that. You know, I mean, take of for example um, climate change. I mean, a lot of the ideological religious basis of climate change denial is apocalyptical. Is you know if if. If it's true that the world's coming to end, bring it on, right? Because that's what it's we're accelerated, waiting for. Accelerated, yeah. Accelerated, yeah. I mean, this is, you know, let's get to Armageddon, you know. Um, and um, uh, and so, you know, we, we can't romanticize this. I mean, this is, um, and, and that in precisely in the name of the second coming of that 
Jesus of Nazareth that that harbor and throw peace, right? The the idea, of course, being that after the the the, the struggle, you get you get the peace you were waiting for, you know. And so, the, you know, that's why again to come back to that article you started from quoting from, that's why I, I emphasize the mystical because what the mystic recognizes is that none of this is in our power. Uh, that there is a um, an important moment of waiting in human experience and human action that isn't quietism, uh, but is a recognition of the limits of capacity, the limits of our capacity to to act. Now, I want to slightly change track, Felix, um, but it's 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 a link nonetheless because one of the one of your articles was written on violence in Northern Ireland and. Um, which, of course, is like, you know, in this part of the world is the essential religious conflict, I guess, you know, is, which uh, looms very, very large in, 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 in all our, in, is to, you know, the Brexit debate, it's huge still. But um, that, that article you wrote was on violence and pluralism, and you talked about nationalism and the construction of the we. Um, and uh, what, what interested me about that was that that was published in, I think, 1993, which was just, must have come out, you must have been writing that in 92, 93, so that would have come out before the Dowding Street Declaration, I think, which was, I think, 93, don't, don't hold me to that. But um, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm asking, though, is that since you've written that essay and you've, you've done a lot of other research on religion and violence, has anything changed for you or, uh, you know, and, and how you sort of understand violence? Uh, probably, yeah. <laughs> uh, Go far back here, Felix, yeah. Really was, um, I was... Just finished my master's, I think, at that stage when I wrote that. Um, and it was kind of responding to um, to a, a debate which has pretty well almost been sidelined by the Good Friday Agreement and so on. You know, you remember yourself growing up in the 80s and the kind of the, 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 the rhetoric was, you know, there's the evil men of violence on the one hand. Uh, and then there's us reasonable people, I'm caricaturing to some extent, but there's also reasonable people on the other who, who if you just let us get on with it and dialogue between us, we'd be able to solve the problems, you know. Um, and I always thought that was very naive. Um, of course, the very people who were making that argument uh, were the descendants of those who had violently overthrown the, the British regime in this, you know, this, in the southern part of, of Ireland, and had uh, had came to power in that way. Um, so that was kind of, you know, uh, that was the kind of the concrete problem I was concerned with at that stage. Um, I guess I I I've, uh, but and, and I wasn't really that concerned with violence per se. I mean, it was more its manifestations. Uh, I guess what's become clear to me in more recent work is that, and this is in line with a lot of debate that's going on at the moment, is that uh, violence is ambiguous between its instrumentality on the one hand and its constitutive power on the other. Um, and that would have been something I just wouldn't have seen clearly, at least, when I was when I was doing that piece. Yeah, I see. I mean, I think a lot of uh, a lot of uh, sort of your thoughts, sort of that you developed after that, and I'll, I'll put up a link on the on the notes to 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 your articles and stuff like that. But uh, in one of your essays, I think just on the phenomenon of violence itself, and I suppose this is not necessarily religious, but it it can be related to religious, is you have this I suppose typology of religion that you've developed, which is you sort of see religion as a sort of sorry violence rather, beg your pardon. As a kind of an interaction between violence perpetrator and victim, is that right? Could you maybe uh, uh, explain that a, a little bit uh, more? Because that that's probably a good way of making concrete what you're talking about. Right. Well, I mean, I think I I, I have a kind of I try to develop a relational account of violence. Um, I mean, where this comes from is recognizing that uh, violent that counting something as violent is itself a, a contested move, you know. So in other words, when we say of something that's violent, uh, we're making a statement, we're making a critique most of, very often. Um, and, um, and my question then was, what 
on, on what basis do we make that judgment? Um, and my kind of what I try to argue is that uh, violence is harm. Uh, but it's harm that needs to be recognized as such. Um, and, and I make the claim that's probably in some ways kind of controversial one, but I think I, I certainly stand over it, that the, the recognition of the victim of the, that violence has taken place against them is essential to that violence. Um, and and in many cases, what from the outside would appear clearly to be violence is not recognized by the victim as such. And and I would I, I want to say that 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 means that it's not violent. It can become violent retrospectively um, uh, when the victim recognizes it as such. And I think this is important. What's well, important uh, in in terms of agency first, because I think it's important because it it recognizes that um, that the coming to awareness of a certain event as having um, violated the legitimate claims of a person not to be harmed. Um, is itself that coming to awareness is itself transformative and can be and can have a retrospective effect. Uh, so can, can be transformative retrospectively. And uh, so, you know, the ex- examples I use are, 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 are for example, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the 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 binding of feet, let's say, in uh, in traditional um, uh, societies, some traditional societies, that women's feet were bound in order to keep them small. Um, to the extent to which that is an, an essential part of your growing into adulthood, say, as a woman in those societies, and you recognize that as such, and it is recognized by your community as such. I don't think you can then come from the outside and say that is violent because what you're you're imposing a certain claim. You're you're saying that person ought to ought to um, a claim for themselves uh, the, a boundary of their bodily integrity that doesn't allow this to take place. So uh, is it like the sort of superimposition of sort of a sort of liberal values of autonomy on a, a different culture? Is that what's kind of motivating I think, this? I mean, that's one manifestation of it for sure. Yeah, but again, it. But it's not. But but I'm not arguing for a relativism here. I don't think I am. I'm talking. I'm arguing for a relativism yeah, you, rather than a relativism. Yeah, we should be clear about that. You're not saying it doesn't hurt, or you know, for example, like you know that that these things oh, can be paid for physically but, or. Yeah, but hurt is. Is itself. I mean, just because something hurts doesn't make it violent, right? I mean, you know. I mean, I've never played rugby, but watching the World Cup uh, in Japan looks pretty painful to me. Some of those things, but I don't think anybody would come out today saying, you know, I've been violently assaulted. Right? Uh, so there's uh, the the. It, it's not the harm that makes, not the pain that it. It's the uh, a harm or a pain which violates the um, the boundaries of the person, the claims of that person. And 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 that and that has to that claim has to be there in order for that to 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 to, to be understood as violent. Now, I mean again, it has to be there or in the sense that we can reasonably expect it to be there, right? So Obviously, if you're talking about an infant, or you're talking about somebody who who isn't uh, hasn't got the um, the the capability of of, of recognizing this, uh, where you talk about animals, it's also an interesting uh, interesting situation. Then I think there, one's talking about cases where one could not we we are putting in criteria that can't reasonably be expected to be fulfilled. Um, but where that is, uh, because, and, if, and the, the crucial point here is that uh, that meaning is relationally generated, you know. So when you have when 
two people act with one another. They are in a relational, uh, they are in relation to one another. Uh, even when there's a power uh, disparity, you still have a relation there. Um, and, and within that, certain um, uh, uh, boundaries of what, it, what, what claims can be made on one another are set up. I think what makes the claim of violence uh, powerful is that is precisely uh, where a, a person comes to the recognition that what was done to them uh, uh, violated uh, who they would like to have been, if I can put it in those terms. Uh, I think about, I mean, you grew up as I did in, in Ireland of the of the 19, where well, you're, you're a little bit younger than me, but like, I mean... Uh, 80s, Felix, 80s, Felix. Thanks for dating me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, where, uh, you know, corporal punishment was just, you know, part and parcel of, you know. Yeah. You know, nobody understood that. Oh, I shouldn't say nobody. Take that back. Uh, but generally speaking, that wasn't understood as being a violent act, right? I mean, that was simply the way things were. I think to to uh, recognize retrospectively um, uh, certain that certain uh, uh, values or certain boundaries or certain claims that uh, that should have been that I claim should have been made for me and by me uh, and were not and were violent, uh, is a way in which I can re-narrate, reconstruct, refigure uh, my past. Um, and, and I think it's important to recognize the act of refiguration there, where I, 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 I so to speak, recover a past. Um, and in recovering it, um, uh, make a claim for myself that I did not make in the past. So that's it's a, that, and, and that I think is and, and 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 I mean why I'm doing this or why I why I want to be want to claim this is precisely because I think that is a affirmation of agency rather than understanding a victim purely in their passivity. Right, and does does the uh, does the question of trauma would, does that complicate matters? Sure, uh, I mean, indeed, I mean, in many ways, this is coming out of a, a consideration of trauma, right? Because, um, and again, this comes back to the earlier part of our discussion, right? I mean, the the traumatic is precisely that which overwhelms our capacity. It makes um, us forget. Uh, may, uh, yeah, or well, in a sense, yeah. Yeah, it makes us forget in a representational sense, right? But but it it, it precisely doesn't allow us to forget, right? I mean, Manu, yes, quite right, yeah. You know, that which remains in the presence as a as a as a foreign body, so to speak. Or the return of the repressed, and sort of if you want to do it in Freudian terms. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and and with the traumatic, you have precisely this strange temporality. Right. I mean, thinking about Freud, you know, Freud talks about this uh, Nachträglichkeit, right? This retrospective, right? So, and and this is kind of again what um, uh, where where Freud says, you know, the 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 victim of the of of the of the uh, of the assault uh, does not recognize herself as such until, so to speak, she understands the meaning of the act itself, right? And that's a retrospective thing. She retrospectively recognizes the meaning. Um, and I think meaning works that way. Meaning works forward and backwards. Um, the um, a certain events do not have sense for us, do not have meaning for us, uh, have a meaning which is totally from elsewhere, which we cannot incorporate it into our own lives. And and how do you overcome that in trauma? You overcome it precisely by refiguring, precisely by a narration which refigures uh, the the experience um, and and develops an agency within it. 
Yes, because the the yeah. So the other the other the other sort of the other dimension of the sort of the violence perpetrator victim is the witness uh, uh, element, which you sort of speak a lot on the idea that sort of witnessing narration, re-narration is uh, essential to this to, to this to, to this relation. Uh, in terms of what you're saying, I mean, what's very interesting to me is the sort of the temporal dimension of what you're taking. But so is it the case then that it would a violent act if violence is perpetrated against say a, a victim? In whatever way, uh, in a say, in a particularly cruel or unusual or an intense way, is it a case did that Woods temporality is in some way impoverished? In terms of what you're talking about, you're talking about in narrative terms, Woods' ability to narrate their life, to sort of see themselves as a span from past to present to future, is that reduced to, I don't know, a present, or is it, uh, or is it just that we are robbed of that particular capacity? Or that particular awareness when we would a violent act is perpetrated against us. I mean, I think there's, I think in all violence, there's a certain uh, uh, restricting of our temporal axes, if I can put it in those terms. And and indeed, I think there is something about violence which goes to the core of our temporality. Uh, if if one thinks of this in uh, I mean, the way I, I try to think of this is think of it in its most catastrophic, so to speak, in order to see how this works. To, to live a life, to live a human life is to live within a world, to live within a context of meaning, that is, one which has a certain stability, a certain constancy, uh, obviously one that is open to disruption, open to change. But that an element of, of of constancy is necessary in order to live a life. But a, a catastrophic acts of violence are ones which go to the core of that uh, of that meaningful world. Um, one can see that with communities. Uh, if you take uh, people living in wars, uh, you can see that in colonization, uh, where where one of the major acts of the colonizer is precisely to break down that meaningful world, to break down that sense, uh, such that the colonized loses their their relationship to the past. Uh, and again, uh, victims of traumatic violence think about people like Jean Amory, for example, in his uh, on the minds on, on the uh, minds limits, or Susan Bryson, her, her wonderful book Aftermath. Uh, mm, both it's a great book, yeah, yeah, uh, but both speak to this that the past before the traumatic event has a, a dream-like quality, right? I mean, it's the, they remember it. They remember that world. But it is not a world that they that has a connection to their lives anymore. It's as if they're remembering somebody else, a, a stranger that mm. wasn't them. Yeah. Doesn't know? Damory say this in At the Mind's Limit? He says, in the context of torture, how, how does he put it? I'm paraphrasing, but the, they who are tortured stay tortured. Exactly. Like the, he says something to the effect that the first blows that were hit, that, you know, that world collapsed. I mean, Amory is very interesting in this because he he goes through how systematically the Nazis took away their world. Um, first and foremost, and again, this is something we tend to forget, is that the very claim that somebody was Jewish, not German, you know, as he says, the person who grew up with, with you know, Beethoven and 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 Goethe. Uh, yeah, he considers himself a German Jew. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Exactly, but suddenly they were told that that doesn't belong to you anymore. That's not you anymore. So that whole world that was there, you know, that's what he's talking about—the intellect. That whole world of the intellect, the whole world of the German language, suddenly is the claim is that doesn't belong to you anymore. He, he has a story there where you know the lineup in Auschwitz, uh, the um, so, so this uh, man, this old man, was asked, you know. What what were you? What, what was your 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 job? And he said, uh, "Ich bin Germanist." In other words, I teach German. The, the 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 SS man beats him up, right? How dare you say you teach the, the you know this this language, this sacred language, you would you? You know, I mean that's that's a kind of a systematic destruction of the world in which we live, in which somebody lives, and the colonizers do no different. They 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 systematically uh, take away that world, 
uh, such that it's no longer meaningful for the person. They can no longer live in the world of their past. And that is, I think, you know, a fun, and, and it happens, as I say, on the on the, on the very individual level. Um, uh, think about, you know, the way in which uh, the kind of the violence that kind of perpetrated against, uh, uh, you know, tra- transgendered people or, or gay people. Uh, and it happens at a communal level as well. Um, and it's that way in which the, 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 the world gets the violence attempts to, so to speak, take away a meaningful totality in which they can live and which they can exist. Or possibilities even, perhaps. And possibilities, right, because it at the same time takes future. away the future, right? By taking away the past, it takes away the future. Um, and um, and so you have no no connection. And so somebody, I mean, uh, Brisson, uh, Bison is very, uh, you know, it's a much more, in a way, well, it is, in a much hope, more hopeful book than, than Amory's is. In the sense that that what she charts is, as she says, the re the rebuilding or the remaking of the self, so of remaking a world or remaking a world. But but it takes that it takes a remaking. What Amory and Brisson do is they give us two sort of uh, responses to violence, right? You know, I mean, Amory says, mm-hmm. and at the mind's limits, what we need to do is resent. You know, we we need to. Uh, I think how does he put it? You know, we sort of to we sort of nail nail the perpetrator to their deed, something to that effect. I think you know, and we got to keep them in the past. You know. And I think I I I I I'm not the first person to say this. Was like I mean that's can be quite a sort of you know cognitively unhealthy. You know that's kind of sort of a corrosive sort of a position to take because you you are in the past. Mm-hmm. So whereas you're saying that Brisson has a more uplifting response, uh, a, a more therapeutic response where the self is remade in some way. Is that is that right? Or is that something? How, how does one do that? How does one sort of re-narrate the self, given that there's been such a sort of excision with, with one's past identity after the traumatic event. What I find about her book is so is so powerful is that she's so incredibly unflinching in the way in which she describes this, you know. And um and so yes, I mean it's a matter of and it's a matter of rebuilding by re-narrating the event, like re-narrating the trauma in order to find a way back to that past self. Obviously it's it's a world that she can never she, she, you can never rebuild the trust in the world that you would have prior to such an event. I mean, you, 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 you. There's a certain, oh, if you say a loss of innocence, so to speak, right? That you can never get back. You can never uh, have that 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 trust you had before. But you can build a certain. You can nonetheless build a certain trust. I mean, she's very interesting in a number of ways. I mean, one is that what she talks about the relational autonomy, as she puts it, right? That so, in other words that she can only recover by through the help of others um, and that her autonomy is not against others but is in relation to others so in, so it's not a self-enclosed autonomy but it's an autonomy that that works with others in community um, but it's also a a certain as she puts it a certain taking of responsibility you know, and and this she says is is the most difficult thing because one of the things she does is she she learns uh, you know um, self defense self defense right, but of course, uh, but she says well, there's a certain type of um, admitting of responsibility in doing that because of course if she had had those self defense classes before and perhaps she would have been able to fight off her defend her, her attacker. And and this is, I mean, she makes this very clear that one has to be, one has to make a distinction. To say that is not in any way at all to say that she was responsible for being attacked, right? That's not the point. But the point is that uh, by, by, she is trying to rebuild a world in which, not a world in which that event could never happen again, but a world in which, if it did happen again, she would be prepared for it, and so it's uh, so it's that coming to terms, uh, which is obviously very painful, uh, but is a way in which the past then gets reconfigured, that and allows for future allows for future possibilities. Yeah, I mean, there's a quite sort of existential dimension to what Brisson is trying to achieve there, 
I think what interested me about that was that it was kind of her acknowledgement of the contingency or the absurdity, if you want to put it in existential terms, of the reality of the world. To her acceptance, I guess, in some way, if that's sort of not too trite a term, her acceptance of the sheer fact that this can happen again and again and again and again. And that, you know, it's it's yeah. it's because of the contingency, because it's the acceptance of the sort of the radical uncertainty of being alive, being human, that she can come to reconfigure herself in some way. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, but but again, I mean, uh, uh, but it yes, there's that existential le- element, but also an element of recognition of power structures and how those power structures contribute to the world that allowed that that to happen, right? I mean, she she has this. She talks about how there there was a rape on her campus, uh, and how the response of the authorities was to impose a curfew on the women on campus, right? In, in the Why not form. impose a curfew on the men, Felix? It's utterly absurd, right? I mean, so so you 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 know, and and she, you know, the point she's making there, of course, is that the victim of rape in our society isn't just the person who's raped at all women, right? Because because um the um the the, the reality of rape makes it a um, a, re, a, a part and parcel of a woman's life uh, to have to curtail herself, curtail her activities in order to uh, to 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 protect herself, if at all possible, from from this reality. And so, the I mean, again, I mean, one one has to uh, part of what I'm trying to what I try to do philosophically, and it's kind of a response to. It's a, in a wider way, it's a response to modernity and the notion of autonomy and modernity. Uh, is try to calibrate the relation between capability and incapability, um, and the relation between the individual and the society uh, in their relative autonomies. You know, and and I think part of the the job of philosophy in this respect, particularly talking about violence, is to point out these contingencies and to point to the um, um, the, the power structures that underlie them, uh, be they gendered power structures, be they, in Amory's case, racist power structures, or indeed um, structures of uh, religious intolerance, uh, or whatever they might be. I mean, that's what's interesting, Felix, about this. I mean, it's it seems to me that this typology that you've developed has, it's applicable in different contexts. Like, you know, you could talk about sort of sexual violence, you could talk about, I don't know, school bullying or psychological violence or physical violence or even sort of syst- systematic violence. In terms of that typology, is that is there is there, do you think that there's differences that need to be accounted for across them? Like, we can't necessarily re- reduce sexual violence to the violence that was visited on a slave in the southern states of America, you know, even if sexual violence was part of that. Mm-hmm. And, and that that's true, absolutely. Um, but and I think one has to be alive to the to the differences. Uh, I think though, there is where I kind of draw a line of uh, division of labor, you know, between say the philosopher and the sociologist, for example. You know, I mean, I think. The, the philosopher's role here isn't necessarily to, um, uh, to to delve into the sociological differences, uh, but rather more to see the commonalities um, uh, between these different types of, in this case, different kinds of violence. Uh, because I think, I mean, you know, we're talking about temporality, we're talking about meaning, uh, we're talking about the body. The, the, in each case, these acts of violence can be understood, I think, as a um, as ways in which, in each of those registers, um, uh, violence is used to uh, subjugate um, a, 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 a person and or a community um, or or a people, um, and. And in each case, you know, their 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 bodily vulnerability, their bodily integrity, their uh, their their meaning structures, their temporal trajectories. In each case, they are in different ways uh, violated. 
and uh, and in many cases destroyed. One question um, that I would like to ask is: um, you, you you allude to Sartre in your writings. Uh, I can't recall the specific article, but you said. Sartre says violence uh, implies nihilism. Yes, one of the more chilling phrases I think you could you could find in Sartre. Is is that something you agree with? I guess is what I'm asking. You know that sort of violence implies nihilism. Nihilism implies wanton negation, and in some sense it 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 it, it, it implies sadism. I guess. I, I mean I don't think you are saying that. I think you've got a more sort of nuanced account of violence. But I'd be interested to see what you have got to say about that relationship between violence and nihilism i mean especially given sort of you know the events we have at the moment sort of we have sort of a, a lot of acts of political nihilism so off the top of my head we could say we talk about that the the incel uh, attack in canada for example so i'm wondering is there a, is there an op- is there a sort of a, i guess you're saying that there's a that there can be more productive forms of violence to that type of uh, political violence because that strikes me as an urgent question i think this goes to the roots of things uh i think i think sartre is right uh, that there is a nihilism in violence uh, and i think he's right in this way it seems to me quite problematic to understand violence instrumentally which is the you know which uh, has often been the case. People would think of violence well as an instrumental question, right? It's it's uh, uh, you you shouldn't be judging the violence necessarily itself, but what the goals are, you know. And so, just war theory, for example, tends to work on that basis, right? I mean, it's it's uh, uh, it's the goals which are being which you're trying to achieve that either justifies or doesn't justify the violence. Now, it seems to me that I can't think of a worse worst instrument than violence, right? I mean, if you think about an instrument, right, think about a pen, right? It's efficient. Yeah, it's sufficient for what you want to do, right? It's not going to, it's not going to suddenly, you know, well, hopefully, unless it breaks, it's not going to leak out ink all over your, all over your page. Yeah, it's right? for it's, purpose. Yeah, it's got a purpose. Whereas violence is by its nature destructive and is, um, and tends to, undermine the very goals that it's aiming towards, uh, such that uh, what you find in um, uh, cases of of, of violence is that uh, it takes sometimes extremely skilled and uh, 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 people and parties and communities to, to manage to limit the violence once it's unleashed. I mean, I'm thinking about Northern Ireland, for example. South like, Africa, I mean, it, yeah. Yeah, South Africa. Uh, you can take many examples. Uh, it, 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 and there's a certain, I would say, violence tends to infect. It tends to infect and it tends to, uh, to corrode. And um, because the, like, when you engage in an act of violence, uh, what you're doing is destroying something. And so, and in that sense, it there is no limit to violence, internal to it, right? Like, if I want to do a violence against somebody, for just to take an example, uh, why do I stop at at hitting them? Uh, why why do I stop at 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 shooting them? Why do I stop at burning their bodies? Why do I stop at destroying their their memory? Why do I stop at you know? Why do I stop at 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 uh, at their, their, at them? Why don't I go on to their families and so on? Right? I mean, what is it within the violence itself that would give me a limit? I don't think there is anything. Um, so there's something highly nihilistic, highly destructive of violence itself. What I think is the case, though, is that what and this is where this could so to speak the flip side of this is that there is a certain exhaustion in violence. So there's a certain exhaustion of violence which in, in, and, and, and which allows, once certain things have been destroyed, allows for a rebuilding uh, and allows for, uh, uh, you know, uh, new meanings to be developed, new, new meanings to be, to, to, to be, to be built up. Uh, so take Europe after 1945, when you're going through the Brexit debate in, in, in the UK at the moment. Um, but the European Union, the social democracy, uh, you know, democratic institutions, uh, all of this that we saw in Europe after the Second World War 
was a, a way of trying to literally from the ashes, from the rubble of Europe, to build something new up. So what the violence does, it is, so to speak, once it's, it, it, it kind of exhausts itself, it allows for that to, um, uh, to, 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 to be built up or to be developed. Um, and, and arguably, human finitude is such that it requires such requires is too strong a word, but that it, well, let me put it negatively, uh, human finitude is such, you, you know, we literally can't do everything at once. I, I don't, that sounds too trite, but, you know, we, we, you know, a world, let's say, I don't know, the world of the uh, Catholic Ireland, just to think, be parochial for a minute, we can't live at the same time as a secular island, right? These are contradictory things, right? So one has to be destroyed for the other to come to be. Nazi Germany and Western democracy, one has to be destroyed for the other to come to be. So there's a certain sense in which the the destruction of one uh, opens the framework, opens the the space for another to develop. I think, and I'm going to, this is going to have to be the last question, Felix. Um, We've been talking for about an hour now. The the one figure that we haven't talked about, and maybe we can bring it by way of conclusion, by way of conclusion, maybe we could talk about uh, Hannah Arendt, uh, because she... um, she talks on about violence and she talks about authority and uh, the difference between authority and authoritarianism and founding violence. But one of the things she does say is that uh, it's it's forgiveness is a uh, well she says forgiveness is sort of a, a key political act because it stops I guess the cycle of violence or the cycle of violence revenge retribution. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, Arendt is is one of the key figures for me. Uh, I think he's. If I can start on a negative first, I mean, I think she overly, she, she has an overly instrumentalized view of violence, uh, I think. And, and I mean, she says at one stage that uh, violence can never be legitimate, uh, but can be in cases justified, uh, but justified by its end, uh, she says right at the end. Um, and it seems to me that violence isn't like that. Uh, I don't think, for the most part, uh, I think it's a, it's almost it's it's an afterthought when one talks about the end to be achieved by violence. The violence seems to me, if you see right across uh, the the board, is more reactive than it is active. It's more responding to the past than it is aiming towards the future. Um, and and I and I think. And, and that's precisely we talk about the nihilism, and I think that's precisely it's 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 if not it's nihilism, it's negate negative element, right? It's trying to negate something. It's trying to negate a past that it sees as unjust or as as it, in some way an affront that it's trying to respond. To. But uh, and, and that kind of leads me to this question of forgiveness. And this, I think, event is absolutely correct about. I mean that that what forgiveness allows then is that. Um, I no longer re- react with violence against the violence that was inflicted on me or that I perceived to be inflicted upon me, but that I allow for a new future, right? And and I, so to speak, open up the possibility, she says, of a new beginning uh, of, 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 of a new future together. Um, and together, I think, is the key word. I mean, she talks about how does the unforgivable, right? The unforgivable are those who... We, their acts are so heinous, and she's thinking about the Nazi, uh, uh, the Nazis in particular, that we cannot bring them back into community with us. Forgiveness allows us to bring us bring people back into community with us, uh, so that we can have those relations again, a relation that was broken down uh, by by the act in question. And um, and yes, I mean, I think that capacity to forgive is is crucial. But I'd add, a, I'd add a segue to it. I mean, it seems to me that a radical forgiveness would be one that wouldn't simply, so to speak, a, a set the, the slate clean, um, but would bring both parties into, into a space where they can question the identities, that are their, their own past identities, that allowed for that uh, previous act to take place. And I think... 
within the, the Christian idea of repentance is something like this, right? Repentance is literally rethinking. Um, uh, rethinking oneself, uh, one's own role in the, 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 the past act, uh, and try to, um, so to speak, reform who one is and to sort of deconstruct, if you like, one's past identity in relation to the other so that new possibilities of identity together are worked out. And that, just to come back to my Northern Ireland piece that you, you referred to earlier, that was my critique of um, the kind of constitutional nationalism that we had in Ireland in the 1980s, which was, you know, just let's keep our, our respective identities forget the fact, you know, that, that one side was was had certain power relations and the other side didn't, right? And just kind of put all that aside and let's just kind of, you know, be nice and friendly with one another into the future. I don't think that ever works, right? I mean, forgiveness is an act of, it's not just an amnesty. It's not just a forgetting, uh, but it's a working through of the past. And I think that, uh, I think Arendt saw that, you know, that, that the new beginning that she talks about, a new birth, is precisely one that works through the past and allows for a refigured uh, past and, a, and, a, and uh, new possibilities into the future. On that optimistic note, I think we should uh, bring it to conclusion. Thank you, Felix. Thank uh, you very much, Patrick.